Let me introduce this dinner, this, uh, this, din this evening dinner speaker, Olivier Blanchard. He actually doesn't need an introduction, if not for saying that uh, his insights, both provocative and uh, rigorously argued, have often attained the highest goal, or what I think is the highest goal, that any macroeconomist would like to achieve. Namely, make people change mind on important issues that were thought as settled and draw from this new perspective momentous economic and social policy implications. One of these issues is the role of fiscal policy and public debt in a low interest environment. Olivier, the floor is yours. Mario, thank, thank you for the incredibly kind word. Uh, it is truly a, a great honor to have been invited to, uh, to give this talk to uh, an amazing, uh, amazingly distinguished audience. It is also an immense personal pleasure uh, to be the dinner speaker for what uh, uh, will be Mario's last Sintra event, at least in this official uh, capacity. Uh, put simply, I'm simply in awe of what Mario has achieved uh, over the last eight years. Um, he will probably be remembered uh, for three words, which uh, on their own and, and without uh, take, having to take any posterior action, uh, literally saved Europe uh, from tragedy. But Remembering him just for these three words uh, would be unfair. And behind the three words, uh, there was a lot of preparation, both intellectual and political, to make sure that the three words were credible. And, and Mario's contribution, I think, to the ECB and to my policy in general is much deeper than just what you know, history will remember, which is probably these three words. Uh, he has done it. Uh, through a combination of, I would say on the one hand, pragmatism and intellectual creativity, uh, and on the other, uh, an exceptional uh, political or geopolitical uh, sense. Uh, that's really what, uh, what defines him. Larry Summers, uh, who gave the speech last year, I think had it right, which is he said, you sometimes meet policymakers who are exceptionally pragmatic and creative, and sometimes you meet policymakers who are extremely good politicians. It's very rare, it's exceptional, that basically you meet uh, somebody who fits uh, both, uh, both boxes. Um, I think when history is written, uh, Mario will probably be there in the pantheon of, uh, of the fathers of Europe, uh, they created Europe, but he saved it. And uh, that's at least as important as, uh, as, as creating it. Now you can relax. That's all the nice things I'm going to say about you. <laughs> because I want to move from Mario to, to the institution, to the ECB. I mean, uh, you know, the ECB is not one person, and you all know that. But through Mario's influence and that of his predecessors, and I'm looking at Jean-Claude there as well. Uh, the ECB has achieved a truly amazing transformation. Uh, it is fair to say that when the ECB was put together at the start, we, or many of us on the other side of the, of the pond, looked at what had been put together and were a bit worried, uh, be it about the two pillars, which looked like a strange combination, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, lack of uh, buying of uh, sovereign bonds, the asymmetric uh, inform inflation uh, target, all this to us looked like a recipe for disaster. I can say this now. I think some of us said it then. Now, and it came close, uh, but what is 
extremely impressive is uh, how much the ECB was able to modify, to transform itself, and basically develop all kinds of new tools, uh, which uh, basically, in the end, have made it uh, a very modern, very, uh, very a great central bank. I mean, if I think about, again, the provision of liquidity uh, the uh, purchase of a much larger set of assets than was in the initial mandate, the negative interest rates. And it has done all this while uh, maintaining or even indeed strengthening uh, its credibility, uh, which is again uh, an amazing uh, achievement. Uh, so I, mean, I would say that the ECB of today is hardly, uh, I mean, the ECB of, of then is hardly recognizable today, at least to an outsider. Uh, it really has transformed itself and adjusted to, uh, to the main changes which have taken place. Uh, so it is clear, again, uh, that it deserves credit, not for being a great central bank, but having helped the recovery which has taken place uh, since, uh, uh, since the financial crisis and, and the euro crisis. And here I cannot resist a zinger. I, I had many more in my initial draft, and they have been removed by people with uh, more sense. Uh, but it seems to me that given how much it was able to change its skin uh, without losing any credibility, uh, I'm still disappointed that it refuses, it has refused, and refuses to uh, consider a higher target inflation. We all understand that if it could happen uh, without the loss of credibility, it would help. Uh, my new twist on this is to think that maybe we could have a target inflation which is higher than usual so long as the equilibrium real rates remain very low, which is the time when you need it. So eventually we would go back uh, if the real rates recover. Uh, to something uh, like the existing target, but for a while it might actually be very useful to have a higher one. I don't think that this implies that the ECB would lose credibility in the light of all the other things that it has done. Uh, but this was a parenthesis, and uh, I will now move to uh, the main part of the speech. So the, the main part of the speech is based on the idea that monetary policy, as good as it is, uh, cannot do uh, everything and that the euro macro policy architecture suffers from two uh, serious weaknesses, which have shaped the history of the last 20 years, and if nothing is done, could shape also part of the next uh, 10 or, or, or 20 years. I'm going to leave aside, I'm going to focus on the euro macro uh, policy architecture, not the euro macro financial architecture, which is a whole different topic on which many people have much more expertise than I. So let me tell you what I see as the two weaknesses of the, of the architecture. Uh, the first one is an old one, which we knew at the beginning uh, had been documented and has been documented since, which is the lack of adjustment of relative prices in a set of countries which suffer from different shocks. Uh, this was at the source of the large current account deficits uh, in the South early on, and we know what happened, and it is now partly at the source of the large current account surpluses in the North, uh, which are not as bad an issue, but are still an issue for, for the Eurozone. I don't think that this issue is solved, and I think it will come back uh, to uh, haunt us, or haunt you. Uh, in, the, in the future. So that's the first thing I want to talk about. The second is newer, and it comes from what I see as the inadequacy of the current fiscal framework in the light of extremely low interest rates, uh, which both have direct implications for optimal fiscal policy, but also have put very serious constraints on what monetary policy can do. And it seems here again that at this stage, Fiscal policy is just not ready to do what it may have to do uh, in the near future of a more distant future. So what I'm going to do is talk about each one. Uh, I'm going to talk about the first one because I think it has been under-talked in the recent past because 
so how we can overcome deficits are partly gone or largely gone. But I still think that's a major issue. But I'll focus much more on, as you could guess, on fiscal policy, which these days is what I think about when I go to sleep. Uh, it's going to be, the other thing I should say is that this is going to be very much 30,000 feet thinking. I'm not going to try to say, you know, the rules should be changed this way or that way. I think that it's important to start at that level, just think about the economics and then eventually come down or at least closer to the ground. But this is, I'm not going to do it. So let me start with, with the first. And before that, I want to start with what would the ideal architecture, macro architecture, policy, macro policy architecture of a common currency zone like the Eurozone uh, could be or should be. Uh, first, monetary policy should be in charge of your level output. That's not the way central bankers would say that. They would say that is in charge of maintaining inflation at target but I've always thought that there was a cause relation between the two, which I've called the divine coincidence. But conceptually, you basically want to make sure that aggregate output at the euro level is at the right level, is at potential. That would take care of monetary policy. The second is for fiscal policy, you should basically ignore macro, and you should run what I would call pure public finance policy, which is what you need to do given the intergenerational uh, redistribution that you may want to do, the aging of population, how you deal with global warming. But you should not preoccupy yourself with what this will do to output because it's taken care of by the monetary authority. And then, when you've done these two things, there's absolutely no reason that demand in any particular country will be at the right level. It will be right at the aggregate level, but not at the uh, individual level. So you're going to have to have relative price adjustments in order to basically generate the demand, the foreign demand and the domestic demand that you need to achieve output. And if you do all these things and all these things work, then you have the best of all worlds. It works perfectly. You have output at potential in all the countries. Uh, fiscal does the right thing, pure public finance, and monetary policy does its job. Now, unfortunately, what we knew, I think, to start is that that's an ideal, idealized version, which basically in practice doesn't quite work. And this is uh, where I want to take the first point. So the first point is relative prices do not adjust, or at least do not adjust fast enough. And we, I think we knew that uh, this was an issue. Some people thought that maybe uh, it would improve under the pressure of having to do so, but it hasn't. Uh, it hasn't happened. Uh, and so, if anything, actually, the downward wage rigidity, which comes from low inflation, has made it even harder uh, to get wage decreases whenever they are, they are needed. So I think the evidence from the last 20 years is relative price adjustment, wage and price adjustment, works very, very slowly at best, and maybe uh, not at all. Uh, can it be solved? I think the honest answer is not easily because I see a, a, a set of, of major issues standing in the way. Uh, there has to be agreement as to what needs to be done, uh, you know, what the configuration of current account deficits and surpluses should be, ideally. That's the first point. Uh, second point is uh, how it should be achieved, whether it should be achieved through inflation in some countries, deflation in others. And then even if in this room we all agreed on these things, then you actually have to have it happen and you have to have these adjustments of wages and prices at the country level, which have turned out to be very difficult to achieve. And on each of these, I think that there has been very little uh, progress. So let me just talk about what I see as the issues. Uh, I'll start with an anecdote, which I think is revealing. Uh, in 2015, the Five Presidents report, which you may remember, said that it would be good to have a Council of Competitiveness and then to have national councils of competitiveness to basically discuss you know, what the adjustment should be. Under the pressure of, I can, think I can say it's not a secret, under the pressure of Germany, uh, there was very strong objection to the word competitiveness 
and these councils have been created, but in nearly all countries, they are called councils of productivity. And I think, if you think about it, I think this reveals a way of thinking about current accounts and competitiveness, which is, which is an issue for, for these adjustments. So that's the first point. I think we don't quite agree on what the right structure of current accounts should be. The uh, second uh, is that there are two ways to adjust. Suppose that you have current account deficits in the South, then you can have deflation in the South or you can have more inflation in the North. Now, it turns out that if you're going to do these adjustments, it is infinitely better from a Euro point of view to do it through inflation because when you do it through inflation, what you get is you get depreciation, and you also get a real interest rate, which actually goes down. When it's done through deflation, say you ask Portugal or Spain to do it, then there is deflation, so you get some of the adjustment of relative prices you need, but you get a real rate, which goes up a whole lot. So when you actually sit down and you forget politics, which I'm trying to do, uh, the optimal adjustment to a set of uh, current account deficits and, and, and surpluses implies inflation in the north, de facto it's in the north, less deflation in the south. If this is true, it actually has an implication for optimal uh, monetary policy at the central level, which is that when you have large current account imbalances across countries, the best way to do it is to do it for more inflation rather than forcing deflation, which means that target inflation for the ECB should actually be higher. But again here, I'm talking at 30,000 feet, but something, something has to do it. The last point is, suppose that we all agree in this room that Germany is going to have a lot of inflation, which is going to allow the other countries to adjust without having deflation. Suppose we did this. And there's still the issue of how you basically get these, relative, uh, these wage and price adjustments. Now, there's something interesting about wage and price adjustments, which is what we're asking countries to do, say, uh, countries which have current account deficits, is to have wages go down relative to what they would have done, and domestic prices, or domestically produced goods prices, go down. So the reduction in the real wage is relatively small. The problem is that it has to come with a decrease in the nominal wage, a decrease in domestic prices. There's still a decrease in the real wage coming from the fact that you import goods and these are more expensive. But in effect, it's larger, the problem of coordination is largely a problem of trust, which is workers will accept a cut in wages or slow wage growth only if they know that the firms will actually pass this through to prices and the real wage will not be very much affected. There is basically no mechanism to obtain that kind of coordination at the national level, except in a few countries. And the lack of trust is such that nobody wants to go first. The workers don't want to be the first ones to cut, which I understand. And the firms cannot commit to prices, given that prices go into all, all directions. So here again, I think for all three reasons, uh, it's not working. and. Uh, unless something is done at each of these margins, understanding, agreeing as to what the right configuration is, agreeing to the best way of adjusting, and then creating what I've been pushing uh, in various countries with total lack of success. Uh, meetings of trilateral meetings with workers, firms, and the state. Uh, if this doesn't happen, then uh, we, will, we may see problems again. I don't think we'll see the problems that we saw at the start of the euro. This was a shock, which was an enormous shock. But the notion that there not, will not be country-specific shocks in the future, I think, just cannot be taken for granted. Okay, now let me move to, to fiscal. Uh, I had a joke, which I will move, but I'm going to put back. <laughs> uh, which is... It was uh, Reagan, Ronald Reagan's uh, quote in which he said the most hated nine words in the English vocabulary are, and you may know the, the quote, I am from the government and I'm here to help you. <laughs> uh, and I suspect that some of you are going to react to my remarks on fiscal policy in the same way. Uh, good, but let me, let me still try. It is, I think we would all agree, 
that interest rates, real equilibrium interest rates, have decreased a whole lot. And uh, uh, markets at least think that this is going to last for a long time. And it has been such a trend that it's hard to think that it's going to reverse any time, any time soon. So in that environment, and here I'm going to paraphrase in two sentences the paper I gave at the AEA meetings, uh, this has two general implications. The first one is an obvious one, which is that the cost of debt is smaller. And that's nearly an identity. But here, uh, the refinement on that statement, it's not just a fiscal cost, which clearly the debt dynamics are more favorable. It's the economic cost. And the notion is that if the rate is so low, it's probably because the risk-adjusted marginal product of capital, to be a bit nerdy about it, is also not very high, which means that the crowding effect of capital, which is there, uh, is not terribly costly. So I'm not going to go into this, but I would say in general, we should be more relaxed about that. That's the first implication. But on the benefit side, uh, there is also uh, an important point. Now, which is conceptually separate. It, could, it need not happen, but basically when interest rates are very low, or neutral rates are very low, and you have very low inflation to start, then you get into the, what used to be called the zero lower bound, what is now called the effective lower bound, and monetary policy loses a lot of its... Uh, uh, ability to affect the economy, in which case you may be stuck, and I think that gives a fairly strong case for using fiscal policy. So a combination of both, lower cost of debt, more need for fiscal policy to maintain demand, I think these are fairly straightforward and uncontroversial implications of the fact that the rates are very low. Now, the first thing I want to say is, well, is your description of the world uh, the right one, uh, you know, a world in which the interest rate is very low, uh, monetary policy doesn't have a whole lot of room. Uh, I think so. That's what let me just develop that quickly. So I think, you know, we've all said many times, don't trust markets. But if you look at the yield curves, we know that they're extremely flat. Uh, this is true here. Uh, it's true. Uh, we can also look at option prices to get a sense of well, not the mean, but you know what some people believe. So what do you think is the probability, based on these option prices, the probability that the markets put on the Euribor rate uh, three years from now being more than 1%? So here we're not talking about just the mean. We're talking about the answer is 0.3%. So you know, you may not be convinced, but there are people putting their money there. Uh, so I think we can assume, I, you know, it may not last forever, but I, I would say that we're clearly in for quite a while. So I'll take that uh, here, just a, a tip to Larry. I think that when interest rates remain low, initially it was thought that maybe the financial crisis was the source of the low rates, although they had decreased before. I think as time passes, it's clear that there's something else. Uh, the effects of the financial crisis are largely gone. So I think that Larry's uh, secular stagnation hypothesis is no longer a hypothesis. It may not be there forever, but it's more. It's, it's a fact. And I think we should take this into account. The second issue is whether there is a euro gap. Maybe may, may, is there a need for fiscal policy at this point to basically help monetary policy? The case would be there if uh, there is an output gap, a negative output gap. It would not be there if the economy for the Eurozone as a whole is about there. I think we can discuss at length, and that goes to the discussion of output gaps and various other strange beasts. But my sense is inflation is far from, I think, where Mario would like to see it. Maybe he will disagree. Uh, it is not that too, for sure. Uh, and I have the impression, looking at least at the countries at which I have looked, that there is, you know, one or two percent unemployment, which is above the structural of the likely uh, structural unemployment rate. So my sense is, yes, uh, there is a need for fiscal policy now. Now, that sense is clearly much stronger uh, if there is a recession. And I would say that the last few weeks, the last few months, and the trade uh, issues suggest to me that that surely is a possibility. If there is a recession, I think it's fairly clear to me that monetary policy cannot do the job alone and that fiscal policy will be needed. The third one is 
has the monetary policy lost how much room of maneuver monetary policy still have? And here, it seems to me that, again, there are many things that the ECB or other central banks can do. They can buy many more assets than they do. And we have the Bank of Japan as an example. You can increase your balance sheets enormously. But whether this will translate into much lower rates and these rates having substantial effects on activity, I think one has to be skeptical. So clearly the ECB should try. It probably has some room to do things, but I'm not terribly optimistic that it can really on its own handle anything like, like a recession. So given this, given this environment as I, as I see it, let me let turn to the implications for fiscal policy. First, in general, and then for uh, common currency areas such as the Eurozone. So let me start with general implications. I see three main implications. The first one is that whatever urgency there was in reducing debt, the urgency is less. That's a matter of arithmetic. Whatever speed of adjustment was required, the right speed today, given the environment, uh, is slower. So I'm not saying we should not care about that. We should. But it is clear that it's less essential uh, to uh, decrease debt and, uh, if it comes at some cost. The second implication is that if demand is too low to deliver output and potential, and again, there is a discussion as to whether that's the case today, but surely would be the case if there is anything like a slowdown uh, in, the, in the Eurozone, uh, then uh, you have to be ready, or the uh, Eurozone has to be ready to use fiscal deficits for cyclical, of our cyclical in this sense becomes long. I mean, it may, may have to use primary deficits for quite a while. Uh, the case of Japan is very scary in this way, which is maybe that uh, uh, fiscal policy uh, deficits have to be used for quite a while. But I see no alternative. Now, ag again, you may want to use other measures, and you know that goes back to structural reforms and kind of a repeated leitmotif that uh, when at the fund had when I was there and still has, which is, well, you should do structural reforms. It's clear that you should do structural reforms, but the notion that they'll get you out, that they'll create such optimism as to increase demand or get you out of a recession, I think is a joke. And therefore, it should be done, but that's not enough. Fiscal, I think, is the only tool you, you have. The third one is if you're going to have primary deficits to maintain demand, there is no reason not to use them right, namely to actually use them to do good things to the supply side. So to the extent that there is an increase in primary deficits, then it seems to me that the priority should be on financing public investment or financing reforms, not just financing current consumption. So our, I think the main reason to do it is to boost demand. It's clear that this should be used to actually boost supply and, and help potentially help growth uh, in the future. So I think these are the three implications. What I want to do last, and then I'll be done, is basically go down not from uh, 30,000 feet to the ground, because I don't think I could actually walk there, uh, but maybe to 10,000 feet and think about the implications uh, for the euro area fiscal architecture. So these are uh, what I see as implications of what I've said so far. So it is really a, a, a repeat of, uh, of, of what I've said, except applied to uh, to the Eurozone. So the first one is that the various rules defining you know, target debt, speed of adjustment to debt, should be revisited. And first, they haven't been respected. And also, I think that even if they made sense at some point, they don't make sense today. And basically, there should be, uh, you know, if tightening uh, fiscal uh, leads to an output gap because monetary policy cannot respond, and it seems to me that letting debt not decrease or increase very slowly is probably the thing to do. Now, whether this is done through a formal change in rules or just by having the authorities in charge be more lenient, we know that there is some leeway, and that's not for me to decide, but it seems to me that 
that signal should be sent. Not that that is irrelevant, not that that is good, but that maybe the priority should be somewhere else. The second, on the uh, use of a primary deficit uh, to uh, do good things for the future, you probably are all aware of what fiscal austerity, justified or not justified, did to public investment in the Eurozone. So since 2007, the ratio of public investment to GDP for uh, the average for the euro has been minus 1%. So we've decreased 1% of GDP. And the numbers are very scary in the countries where it should be the reverse. So it's basically 2.3% for Greece, 2.7% for Spain, 1.3% uh, for Portugal, 0.9% for Italy. It seems to me that that's just wrong. And therefore, if we have primary deficits, they should be used for projects like this. Um, I think in this context, uh, the idea of having uh, what's known as a fiscal golden rule, which is the separation of the current account and the capital account, and being more lenient again about the use of debt for the capital account, is clearly something which should be introduced. I think we're all aware of the dangers of doing this, uh, it has been introduced, it was introduced in the UK, and, and that was cheating on a large scale. But I think it can be done. Uh, again, an anecdote here. Uh, I was in a Euro country not long ago, where uh, somebody in charge explained to me that reducing the age of retirement, making retirement earlier, was public investment. And the argument was fairly straightforward, which is that this liberated jobs for the young, and the young are the future. So that's, I think, what you don't want to happen. But that can be taken care of by having some commission in Brussels, which basically puts a check mark when you come with projects. But I think in the current context, that would be important. Last two points, which reflect uh, the specificities of, of, a common, uh, of, the, of the Eurozone. The, the third one has to do with the coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. In a world which I'm thinking about, uh, there is a need for coordination between the two. Before that, it was separate, and in the ideal scheme, it is separate. But here, fiscal policy has to come to the rescue, if I may use that expression. It is very difficult to do with 19 countries and 19 ministers of finance. So I think the argument for having somebody who would be the counterpart to Mario or to his successor, being in a position to say, yes, we need some common fiscal expansion or not, is probably more relevant today than it ever was before. And then the last one is externalities, which are very uh, relevant. Uh, suppose that you need expansionary fiscal policy at the, uh, at the euro level. So it, it is agreed that you know, basically you should have a 1% increase in, in, the, in, the fiscal, uh, in, in the fiscal deficit. How is it achieved? Well, if you let each country do what's best for itself, you will basically get an undersupply of fiscal expansion. And the reason is spillovers, the fact that when you do a fiscal expansion in your country, and you're a small country and an open economy, basically you tend to benefit others, which is good, but you don't care about. And therefore, the question is, what can be done in this case, I think if you just, even if you say, look, have fiscal deficits, the implication is countries will probably not do enough. And so in this case, there's an argument for coordination, and I think it can be done in one of two ways. The, the first one is to have the countries which are able to do it uh, have a coordinated fiscal expansion. Uh, so by able, I mean that some countries may not be able to because of their fiscal situation. And then in this first case, each country would basically issue its own debt. That's very much what happened in 2009 with the G20. Basically, it was a coordinated increase, and it helped, is my guess. But not all countries would be part of a, of, of a scheme. Then the more ambitious one, but which implies some risk sharing, uh, is basically to have a common budget and to do it from the common budget, issuing euro bonds in order to, uh, and this would allow all countries to participate. It would clearly be better from an economic point of view, uh, but it would have some of the implications which have made that kind of free sharing uh, likely uh, 
uh, not happen quite yet. So let me conclude. Uh, I realize that I've offered uh, kind of blue sky thinking, if you, if you know the expression, basically, you know, stuff that academics can say, but politicians uh, face more constraint. I, I've realized all the complex uh, geopolitical constraints that, uh, that in the end will determine the outcome. But I still think it's the right place to start. I think it would be a waste to start you know, by saying, should we go from 60 to something else without thinking about the, the, the bigger issues and then coming down from there. Uh, anniversaries, and this is the 20th anniversary, are good times to assess both progress and, and, set, and setbacks. And uh, when needed to actually make bold moves uh, I think my trade policy has done that. And so, again, congratulations. But the rest of the architecture is just not quite right there. And uh, it may not be completely smooth sailing in the future. Let me stop on this terribly optimistic note. Thank you. Thank you.